All right. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for attending um, this Career 201 Navigating the Workforce. We're so excited to have everyone here, um, and we're going to get started. We want to be mindful of everyone's time, so yeah, let's go. <clears throat> So just to do a quick overview of the session, we're going to start out with um, introductions of the panelists, which we're going to do shortly, a little icebreaker just to like touch base with everyone, see how everyone's feeling. And then we'll jump in with a presentation from one of our field faculty advisors from the Mandel School, Angie. And then we'll have a presentation from Lisa, who's the Assistant Director of Student Experience with Postgraduate Planning and Experiential Learn Education. Um, and then we'll have a panel prompted Q&A with some alumni of ours. Um, so Gillen, um, Joanna, and Bubana. So with that, we can get into it. Um, we'll open up the questions at the end too, but feel free um, as we go to put it in the chat if you have questions along the way. So with that, also presenters, feel free to also do this. Um, check-in. So I did a little meme check-in to see how everyone's feeling today because I know it's sort of the end of the semester, finals week. So please put in the chat the number um, you feel most represents you um, with the little animal faces there. So <laughs> feel free. Yay, I'm also putting in an eight. I saw some eights and threes. Um, yeah, thanks so much for everyone to participate. I'm glad I don't see too many, like, I know there's some that you might be feeling a little down, so, because it's finals, but I'm glad we're all feeling good and energized and ready for the session. All right, so I guess we can get started. Angie, if you want to take it away, feel free. Great. Yeah. So I am going to um, set up to share my screen here. And um, I am going to be talking about uh, some of the ways that you can consider fitting your field experience um, into this whole process when you're looking at the job search. So let's see, slideshow here. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yep. Excellent. So, all right, this is a really exciting time. I love talking with students as they're getting ready for this whole process. And I know there can be a mixture of feelings from people when they're, when they're looking at this coming up. But um, the good news is, is that everybody here has experience, right? So um, really finding ways that you can highlight uh, your, uh, your field experience and then match that with jobs that you're looking at, okay? So I've got a couple of practical tips I'm gonna talk about. One is obviously you're gonna need to update your resume. So we really wanna make sure that you highlight um, all that rich, valuable experience that you've gotten in your field placement. Um, you want to um, utilize your learning agreement, you know, look back at all the placement opportunities that you've had, um, pull some of those special projects that you've worked on, um, special trainings, um, any kind of, you know, professional development hours that you've had, different modalities that you've had exposure to, screening tools, uh, anything like that. And also keep in mind, too, that sometimes people uh, feel like when they, they pick that uh, second year placement, that that's going to be the, definitely the population they're going to work with and definitely the role that they're going to have. And I, I want to welcome you to, if you're interested, um, you can think outside of the population that you've worked with. There are many, many transferable skills in all the different, you know, roles that you've played and experiences that you've had. So if you see a job out there that doesn't exactly align with what your field experience was, um, don't necessarily discount that. You can definitely find ways in which um, your experience, you're able to transfer some of those, those skills, okay? 
So um, I, I really encourage students to kind of begin with the end in mind, right? And some of you have probably heard me talk about this since, since you first came into this program. But what I encourage people to do is do a dream job search and look at exactly the language that they're using. So, um, you know, and that might mean adjusting some of the language that you're used to using, you know, um, as far as terminology, um, acronyms. So, you know, when I, when I said about, you know, making sure that you highlight if you have experience with screening tools, just as a for instance, or um, a certain kind of assessment tool or anything like that, um, use the actual acronym, but then also be sure to define what it stands for. Because sometimes if you're in an organization that uses these things or uses these acronyms all over the place, um, sometimes those acronyms can be specific to your organization and you know what you're talking about and somebody at your field placement knows what you're talking about, but somebody at another organization might not have um, an idea of what that is. So um, feel free to use the acronym because those can really pop out to people that are familiar with them, but also be sure to identify um, exactly what that is. Okay. The other thing that you want to make sure that you include on your resume um, are any, um, if you were involved in IPE, CP1, if you were involved in the student-run health clinic, any interdisciplinary projects, um, please be sure to highlight that as well. And a nice way to kind of have this on your resume, sometimes I get questions from students about, you know, well, it wasn't really employment, how, you know, what do I call it? And a, a nice way to kind of bundle all of that is just to have a heading that says experience. Um, and then that allows you to talk about your field experience, but then also highlight um, some previous employment um, that you had that you also can have to have transferable skills involving that. Okay. The other thing is use your field network. So if you're not already, tell everybody at your field placement that you are on the job market and tell them what, what it is that you're looking for. Um, mention it to your collateral contacts. Um, and this is, this is a really great way to hear about opportunities, to make connections sometimes directly with somebody who's going to be doing some of the hiring. Um, really use that field network. Another way that I want you to, um, you know, really be using that field network is to start thinking about uh, who would be appropriate to get a recommendation letter from. So this is probably your field instructor, a task supervisor, maybe another collateral contact that you've worked with. Um, now is a good time to just, you know, ask politely if they'd be willing to write you a recommendation letter. Um, that can just be really short and sweet. Just a paragraph is us will usually suffice. Um, and if they can address it to whom it may concern, then you can just have those on file for, you know, when that dream job pops up and they say, we need three recommendation letters, um, then you kind of ha you have those, you know, in your portfolio of things where you can use those over and over again. It's also a nice time to be asking for those too, because you can give people plenty of time to be crafting that um, rather than saying, you know, I want to turn in this application tomorrow. Can you get it to me tomorrow? Um, this way you can you start thinking about those people and give those people, um, you know, a week or so for that. Start um, kind of a bank alongside recommendation letters. Start kind of a, a, a list for yourself. Bank your references, you know, like um, make sure that you have who you'd like to include, you know, on your resume as a reference. You have their job title, um, you have their phone number that they would prefer to be contacted at, their, um, and their email address. And just, again, kind of have this in a portfolio of stuff that as these jobs become available, you can pluck from that um, and have it ready to go. Because you're going to find, you know, as you're applying for jobs that you're going to use these things over and over again. And uh, again, consider your collateral contacts. So many of you that are working um, in organizations um, have contacts with uh, people who are outside of that organization for, for whatever reason. Um, so do consider, you know, mentioning to those people, um, you know, what kind of position that you're interested in and that you're looking for. Um, spread the word far and wide, right? Okay. Any questions so far about that? 
I know I talk a mile a minute, so. I have a question for you. Okay. Um, uh, for regarding the recommendation letters, is this different than like, you know, when you apply for colleges and like they kind of, and not anonymously, but like you don't see the recommendations letter and they just submit it. So for jobs, because I haven't seen that yet, where they ask for rec letters, if they no. do, are we submitting it? Or are we putting like, for example, I'll put your email and then you get it and then you submit it. Yeah, some organizations do do it that way. And that will usually be apparent, um, you know, on the job posting, you know, to they'll, they'll let you know, like if there's a link you need to send to people or if you input their email, it's going to auto generate something. Um, but this is this is something different. So these are just letters that are um, they're great to have on hand for the organizations that don't do that. Um, and that instead say, you know, we need three letters of recommendation. And then that way it's just easy. You just have them, have them right on hand. It also doesn't hurt sometimes if, you know, you've got these really strong recommendation letters to just submit them with your, uh, with your materials, whether or not they ask for them. Cause typically there's going to be a spot somewhere in the hiring process where they're going to ask for, um, some reference or another. So. Okay. But, and is it appropriate to ask like professors that for those or just field? Yeah. Yeah. It is appropriate to ask professors, but do make sure you ask at least one person in field so that, you know, right. I mean, a professor will be able to talk, you know, about, um, you know, your academic performance and, um, you know, reliability and probably some clinical skills if it's a, a clinical class. Um, but definitely um, get some feedback from somebody in field. Yeah. Okay. Great Thank question. you so much. Okay. So uh, the other thing is too, you have experience doing this already. So many of you that um, had a, a second year placement use those placement process skills. So some of you may recall um, you know, what we recommend in the beginning is that you, once you identify a job that you're interested in, email an introduction, attaching your resume, and then say in the email, remember this was just like when you were looking for a field placement, say in the email, I'm going to follow up with you by phone on Wednesday, for instance. Um, and then that gets the ball, that gets the ball rolling. So um, I also recommend doing this even if you have gone directly to somebody's site and um, you know filled out an application in that way. It never hurts to just send a follow-up email. Hi, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm really interested in this position. Um, I wanted to send an email to let you know um, that I'm I'm highly interested. Just something very um, very basic. But uh, the more touch points that you can get in reaching out. Um, the more likely you are to get a response. And the other thing too that, you know, you'll think back on, uh, you, we talked about this when you were looking at your field placement, is to not just think of it as um, a job interview like an audition, but thinking of it as job shopping, right? So asking questions and considering what your goals are. So this is not a process that's just about are they going to hire me? But also, do I want to be hired by them? Is this an organization that I want to work for? So you may want to ask some questions about, um, you know, if you're going for public service loan forgiveness, you may want to find out if they are a nonprofit, if they would qualify for that. Um, you'll want to, if you're interested in your licensure, then you'll want to ask questions about whether or not that supervision is going to be supported. Um, as all of you know in your field experience, um, supervision is, is a critical part of the experience. So asking questions about who will be my direct supervisor and will I have weekly supervision? That's something that we expect in uh, field and it's not something that always happens at every organization. So um, do be really clear about that so that you can make sure that that's a good, uh, a good match for what you're interested in. And then as we know too, your education and your training and your learning does not end when your field education and your, uh, you know, your academic program ends, right? We are lifelong learners. And so you wanna be considering, you know, what further training 
uh, am I interested in? And does this organization, does this position uh, support that? So any questions from anybody about how to apply your, your field experience within this whole process? It feels good to go out there knowing you already have experience, right? <laughs> That's the key. That's, that's why we love field. Great. Right. Thanks so much, Angie. Yeah, we can um, answer more questions if people do have some later too at the end. So we'll give some time for that. But I thanks. And we'll let Lisa do hers um, now. So feel free, Lisa, to take stage. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm from Postgraduate Planning and Experiential Education, AKA Career Services at Case Western Reserve University. So um, to piggyback on a lot of the points that Angie made, I'm going to talk briefly about differentiating between that follow-up with employers and questions to ask and informational interviewing. So informational interviewing is a powerful tool that you can use. Uh, predominantly jobs are found through networking. And informational interviewing lets you be in the driver's seat. It's where you reach out to a working professional who's, who you aspire to be like or who's doing work you find interesting and ask questions about it. Uh, if it's an alum, if it's at a professional that you find on LinkedIn, um, you have other resources available too. We have the Alumni Career Network. We also have a, a platform called CareerShift that you have access to as a case student. Um, so, when you find these people, you differentiate. If, once you apply for a job, you're considered a candidate. And then it's more communication about the status of that opening. If you interview, asking good questions. When you're networking, and if you go into this blind, in informational interviewing, be cautious not to ask the person for the job. You're tapping them for information. And so along those lines, I, I found a page that might be helpful to you. So, and I'll share these links in the chat when I get off screen, I'll put a bunch of them in the chat or Kelly, if you prefer, I'll just send them to you afterwards and you can pass them along. So in an informational interview, this one's specific for social work, um, asking the person how they got started in the field, all the way to, do you know anyone else I could speak with? Which is a great question to end if you do an informational interview. So I'll share this link, but these were some industry specific questions that you might want to consider. Uh, in the event that you're already in the running with an employer, um, we have, these are suggested questions and these are just very general, but there's always a point in time, typically in an interview, once you're in the running for a job, that they'll say, what questions do you have for us? And it's easy to freeze. Obviously, if you're in an interview and they've been peck pecking you with questions, you can get tired. So I do suggest you have two to three questions prepared that you can ask the employer. And if you need help with those, this webpage offers some uh, suggestions for that. And then you can tailor them and make them your own. The other place to go with help with interviewing and specifically about proper questions to ask a question, this is a, the My Career Portal and all case students have access to this. Once you log in with your case credentials on the right hand column, there's a resource called Big Interview. And Big Interview is really powerful. It has a whole segment about informational interviewing. So if that tool is new to you, I suggest that you here would go into the learn section and there are written curriculum modules in Big Interview. And if I go down to, um, I think it's module eight. Nope, pardon me, module nine, I'm one off. Here we, nope. This one, well, hold on a second. I had it written here. <laughs> so it's practice industry, uh, what did I say? Module nine. Where's my big interview tab? Oh, right in front of me, module four. So if informational interviews are new to you, here's a whole bunch of information on how to engage in these. Um, 
from an interview practice standpoint, if you go to the practice tab here and we go to practice interviews by industry, and like I said, I can, I'll share all this afterwards, how you find this. If we go to, um, I better make this smaller. I think it's human, is it healthcare? Nope. Public service, public relations, nonprofit sector. There we go. And here's one for social work. So this is, um, this resource is intended to help you practice. A lot of interviews are done virtually with video platforms like Zoom. So you can actually record yourself if you like. Um, the way this works, it uses your camera and you'll have, um, these are question sets that a little interviewer will ask you. Um, you can look at the tips and answers to the questions so you can kind of gauge what's appropriate for different interview questions. So don't deny the power of this resource. I encourage you to use it. It's available 24 seven. We pay the fee for students to have it because inevitably interview opportunities come up and it's not always convenient to schedule a mock interview appointment in our office. So this is available and I thought it was pretty slick that it actually had practice sets for social worker. So that's another resource uh, for you to consider. Then good things happen. Ultimately, you may get to a point where the employer offers you a job. And a lot of times that salary negotiation can bring anxiety to people. So um, I always say, do your research. There are Federal Department of Labor sites that you can screen what the data says about what's appropriate for um, the bell curve of pay rates within geogra geographic areas. So, and then you could look at our first destination sur survey, salary.com, Glassdoor. So this, just gives a nice tutorial about how to negotiate and about when you accept an offer, some protocol to keep in mind. So I'll share this web link as well. And then lastly, I just wanted to point out, um, you can always schedule appointments in our office. Um, I meet with a lot of the social work students. I've had a couple already, woo woo, that have received job offers and they're in the negotiation phase. So that's always very exciting. Um, if you need help figuring out how to find me, we have information on this webpage about how to schedule appointments with postgraduate planning and experiential education. And I think that was the bulk of the content that I was covering this evening. Thanks so much, Lisa. That's so helpful, especially just walking through some of those platforms, I think. And some of our um, nonprofit students as well, I think, would really benefit because I saw that other tab for specific for nonprofits um, as well. So thanks so much. And uh, yeah, we're going to move on to the alumni panel, but feel free um, to put questions in the chat along the way too for any of our presenters. Um, but I'll let Therese take it away. <clears throat> Hi, so at this time we're going to have um, some prompted questions for our alumni. We want to thank Gillen and Joanna and um, Buvana for agreeing to participate and be a part of the panel tonight. Um, and so we're just going to do some guided questions and then we'll open it up for general questions for the participants. So with, Real um, quick, Charisse as well, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. I was thinking too, if each of you want to do like a better introduction than our just general one, maybe we can start with that and then go into the questions if that, if everyone's okay with it. <clears throat> I think that's a good idea. Thanks, Charisse. <laughs> can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Galan Mirwanji. I'm the social work supervisor with the Harris County Office of Manage Assigned Council um, in Houston, Texas. And I graduated from Case Western Social Work School in 2015. Nice to meet you, Galen. Same here, nice to meet you all. <laughs> Bhuvana or? Sure, I can go next. Uh, my name is Bhuvana Nanda Kumar, um, and uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, and um, I go way, way back with MSAS and uh, Weatherhead. Uh, I uh, was a dual graduate, uh, dual master's 
both um, uh, social work and um, uh, MNO. I was in the MNO program um, together in 2002. So 20 years ago oh, wow. um, uh, is when I graduated. Um, my, uh, I, I walked the graduation with my one month old child uh, uh, who is now 20. So oh, wow. <laughs> I have you beat Bhuvana. I am, so I'm Joanna Hardis. I am local in Cleveland Heights and I was uh, graduated MCS in 96 and um, have a private practice that I've had for four years, specializing in the treatment of OCD and anxiety disorders, but have had a long, have been a therapist um, for about 26 years in different fields in the area and done a whole bunch of different things. All righty, nice meeting you all. And thank you again for being part of the panel. Um, so we're just going to start with some prompted questions, and then uh, we'll open it up again for the participants to ask any questions they may have of the panel or the guest speakers today. Um, so the first question is um, from your personal experience, and can you share a personal experience in networking, networking and navigating, negotiating, I'm sorry, salaries. So personal experience and networking and negotiating sal salaries. So if anyone want to share anything about that tonight. I can start if you all are okay with that. Yeah, so for me, I worked in nonprofits and in government agencies. In government agencies, it was more structured because it was a pay schedule, pay grade one to 10, depending on how many years you are in. And the negotiating, was, the negotiating process was for me that the experience that I gained while doing my field placement should be counted as years of experience from the master's level experience. And that was what I was able to successfully portray to them based on the skills that I had gained. While in nonprofit, we didn't, it was a little bit more loosey goosey in that process of negotiating. So they would not want to pay a bit higher salary to keep it fair. However, sign in bonus, transportation, licensure fees, supervision for licensure, all that was something we were negotiating, including PTO and vacation hours. So that was um, really important. And I learned early on in the process that that is something we can work around with and we can at least from the table for negotiation purposes. So a little bit more creativity than just looking at the salary package or the dollar figure was helpful for me. Thanks, Gillen. Did anyone else want to share anything? I think uh, my experience from a direct service perspective is, um, <laughs> you don't really have any leverage in which to negotiate because if you don't have experience, you don't have any leverage. So now in private practice, I have a lot of leverage and can set my price. I think early on, I agree with what he said in that I could, you look for, and I think it's what Angie had also said, you look for uh, your first job or first jobs that you that you can have other perks in other words good supervision top-notch clinical training uh, opportunities for learning a really rich clinical environment especially if you want to do direct service a productivity um, expectation that's not astronomical um, so I think that's really, if you want to do direct service where you have to look, because realistically, you, you don't have anything to offer. You might have field, but it's not enough to negotiate the kind of salary that you can as you, as you get experience. So I think it's looking for all the other things that you want in those first couple jobs. All right. Thank you for sharing. Um... Did Bovana, did you want to share anything or? Um, uh, not a lot to add to what um, uh, both of you said, um, uh, except to again emphasize like Joanna did on the intangible. Sometimes there are things that are um, uh, out there that are not um, a direct part of the salary um, the salary scale that you might, um, uh, you might want to uh, factor in when you are thinking about the um, offer itself. Uh, right. Location and again, uh, like Joanna said, you know, supervision, the quality, um, uh, the work life balance, so many other things come into play. All right, thank you all for sharing. Um, 
also, so the next question is, any advice on starting your own business or practice? We may have some students that may look into that. And I know, jo Joanna, you mentioned about having your own practice. So if there's anything that you would like to share with the students or the panel, I mean, the, the guests tonight. How honest do you want me to be? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I don't recommend it. I mean, I recommend it. It's my dream job and I have a really successful private practice because I have 20 years of building a reputation in the, in the area of specialized training, of networking, of building up a name um, and kind of do it, you know, of creating the infrastructure. There's no way, I think there's no way, and I get a lot of calls from graduate students about this very question, and I'm happy to answer them. You, you, I think it's a, I, I think it's a really hard thing to do mm -hmm. right out of the gate because there's so much you have to learn. There's so you don't have a name for yourself, so you end up having to take lots of insurance, which means you have you have to take lots of volume of patients, and you just don't have. You, you, I, I think it's really, really difficult. And then you don't learn what you need to learn by having great, a great um, training. You're focusing on the wrong things, in my opinion. I think it's great later on. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And do any of the other panelists have anything to add or? Yeah, I too started off um, um, and have my own consulting practice. Uh, in uh, While I was at MSAS, I uh, was in the management concentration. So slightly different, not direct practice. So insurance uh, didn't come into play as much. Um, and uh, I agree with Joanna that it is not an easy thing. Um, however, for me, it turned out to be the best thing. Uh, and I think part of that had to do with um, uh, what I said earlier. I graduate when I graduated. I had a little baby to take care of, and um, uh, I did not have the um, you know. Uh, in some ways, it was a family choice. It was a personal choice that I made that I would um, try and be flexible with my hours and um, let my husband uh, bear the burden of, um, uh, you know, uh, of being the major income earner. Not that I, you know, um, I, it just, it was a choice that we made together um, consciously. Uh, and so I started my consulting practice. Um, management consulting for me was um, a, a very, um, I think it was a very good fit uh, because I was able to work on weekends Mm -hmm. And I was able to be flexible with my time, um, you know, uh, but it's, it's a hard road. Uh, starting a business on your own is a hard road. 20 years later today, I'm in a very comfortable position, um, you know, uh, but uh, it's not what you see when you start out. Uh, <laughs> but um, I don't think that should, uh, that should preclude you. Uh, from starting on it, uh, so long as you're clear that that's what you want to do um, and uh, you're open. It's two things, you know, being clear about what you want to do and be open for, um, you know, uh, what uh, what might come your way. Thanks, Bhuvana. Gillen, I see you. Uh... I'll just add a little bit to that. So I don't own my own practice. I've only usually worked in nonprofits and governments. However, on the side, I know people have, um, and myself, I have also done 1099, like a contractor position where you are gaining experience. And I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, but that is the way many people do it. So they have part-time jobs or they have full-time jobs and they do this on the side where they will have three or four clients and they will do it on the weekends or the evenings to start getting that practice. And if you do take the that route um, and you're working with somebody else who has their own practice but they're just bringing you into their business as a, and they make you use like simple practice which is one of their pr program management systems or whatever J choose the people that you're going to work with um, in doing you and having your own clients the ones that you align with um, make sure that they are in the for the right purpose I when I was interviewing for multiple like on this sideline private therapy this kind of position, there were a lot of people who were doing it for the money and you could see it and they were not passionate or trained in particular um, therapies or modules or modalities or clients or specifications. So just be careful when you do go that route, who you choose, um, because sometimes some things look, seem to be too good to be true and they are too good to be true. And so you want to be careful, but I've seen people do that on the side. So they may not start with their own practice, but start with a side business kind of a thing as an independent contractor which I'm not against, but just over the time that will get you the credibility, but just know who you're working with. That's great advice. 
I've had several people with whom I supervise that have done that. And I think that's, re that's a great way to get your feet wet and do it. That's great. All right, so we have another, oh, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, the one thing I wanted to add that personally for me ended up being of great benefit was that with nonprofit, with consulting for different nonprofits, I was able to get a variety of experience that, that I would not have had if I had just worked with one. And I have done both. And I have done both. The kind of um, uh, variety uh, that I get, because then, you know, you're working with an advocacy organization, the homeless shelter, I was able to do all of that at the same time. Not at the same time, but over the years. And I think that breadth of experience that I ended up having, to me, was priceless. All right, thank you. Um, and then we have another question for the panelists and it looks like we may get a, be getting a couple questions in chat. So Kelly, after I do the next question, sure. we can probably go to chat. Um, what advice would you give your graduating self if you can go back and what do you wish you had known um, back when you graduated that would be helpful for students today? So for me, the skill on going back, um, one, to get the right supervisor, know who you're working for, not only the organization or the team, but your direct supervisor. Um, it, sometimes you will have a supervisor who will give you supervision. Sometimes you don't have that in-house and you will have to find somebody out-house. So know if that's going to be paid for because you don't want to be surprised thinking that something's going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, number two, work towards your licensed clinician um, licensure, I would say early on, because I was the one who said I will never need it. I'm not going to use it. I'm happy with my licensed master's social work. I don't ever see myself doing that. And here I am seven years later, working to my LCSW. So I was like, I wish I just had got done with it and was over with it, but it's okay. But um, so that's number two. I would say those were the two things. And three, um, I would say that don't, when you are looking at the job, make sure that you're going to enjoy that position because the first two or three years more than the dollar amount, which is important. So, you know, everybody has to pay their bills. You want to get the solid foundation. And once you have your solid foundation, then you can go on and, you know, choose what you want to do. And that's how I did it for myself. I started at a low pay, but it went high because I got that foundation and I knew exactly what I was going for, what market I was um, getting myself into and stuff like, and the experience I needed. So those would be my three going back to graduation time. Joanna or Bovana, did you wanna to add to that or we can just open it up for questions that we received in the chat? I mean, I think you know what he said is so important. I think the other thing is take risks. I mean, take risks in terms of uh, talking to people because I, in going back to one of the slides about ask, you know, inter informational interviewing, contact people. One of the great things about social media now is that everybody has so social media. They're on Instagram, they're on, and people are really kind. People contact me, I talk to people a lot. I have been, I have reached out to some of my, you know, now mentors, they've shared manuals with me, they've given advice to me. And I don't know that in my younger years, I would have done that, but people are actually kind and accessible and generous. And another piece of advice that I got, um, because I've always been schooled with psychologists is that social workers have to work harder because unfortunately there is still a stigma in a in direct service of being a social worker and that there were not as clinically um, rigorous. And I think it's really important and Galan was saying this, where you do your placement, making sure it's evidence-based practices. And my, you know, one of my earlier supervisors said, you're gonna have to work harder to prove yourself. And I think that that's very, very true. And so, you know, take risks. There's a lot of free stuff out there because you have to work harder to just stay current and evidence-based. I would add, um, don't forget to advocate for yourself. 
um, as uh, you know, graduates of social work, we are, um, uh, it's an important role that we play in society. Uh, and that's often not recognized. So um, uh, if we have to say it out loud ourselves, we must, and don't be shy to say so. Uh, and the second thing I would add is uh, your mentor. Have a mentor if you don't have one already. I hope you all have someone, um, hopefully within MSAS uh, or somewhere uh, within um, CASE uh, that can be your mentor or you know, even in, in your um, field placement, uh, who can be your mentor. Uh, and I'm still in touch with my mentor, for my field, field advisor from 20 years ago. Um, and uh, she played a very important role in my professional development. So I would just say, um, if you don't have one yet, uh, make sure you have one. Think of who you want to be when you grow up. Go catch them and tell them you want to be them. Uh, you want to talk to them. All righty. Thank you all for... Um... Your, sharing your experience with us tonight. And then we're gonna open it up at this time for any general questions from the participants. Um, it looked like we had one question in the chat and it is, what is your advice on doing contracting work for advocacy organizations? Bailey, is, I believe that question was from Bailey. Did I, if you wanna expand on that a little bit more? Um, yeah, so um, if you're wanting to do more macro work um, with advocacy organizations um, and potentially getting various experiences with different organizations, um, how, I guess, how would you go about getting the foot in the door of doing that? And also, like, would you recommend macro um, contract? Yeah. All right. Did any of our, anybody feel, um, anyone want to take a stab at it? <clears throat> I'm sorry, can you please the repeat stop? the question? I wasn't quite clear. Um, yeah, so um, I guess if you are wanting to get into um, macro advocacy work, um, what is your recommendation of going about doing that? And then also if you want to get into potentially doing contracting that's in the realm of advocacy, um, how would you recommend best getting your foot in the door? Maybe it's something. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to say, um, you know, that I would really encourage you to um, activate your field network, you know, talking about that right now to, um, you know, in your field placement with your, your field instructor to get an idea of um, how somebody could go about that if they have ever contracted with anybody um, and, you know, employ some of that informational interviewing um, techniques that Lisa talked about so that you can, uh, you know, maybe start to see a, a pathway that somebody else has taken that, uh, that, that you also could do. Thank you. I think for me in my work with, when I was doing policy works, I don't know if this is going towards that, like macro policy work or not, or if this question is going another direction, but if it's policy work, I got a lot of my positions through LinkedIn. Um, and in talking with other policy specialists and analysts, and just depends like, what are you looking for? Like if it's healthcare, if it's criminal justice, if it's environmental, like depending what kind of um, advocacy you're looking for, um, there are tons of positions out there in LinkedIn, but most of my pos positions I've got is through that, especially with advocacy and more macro level work by directly reaching out to folks who are hiring, showing my interest in their position and, I, I think my first one was right out of, um, it was a um, economic justice specialist position with the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And it was right out of grad school from social work. So, and I did it based just on my experience with networking directly, but I'm not sure if that's the question towards, because I'm not done contracting work with advocacy. I've just done full-time positions, so. I'd like to add also, because I've had this question come up in career consulting appointments. So 
we have three working professionals in this Zoom room, and there was some dead silence with this question. So I would point out a lot of the things you're learning are in an academic setting. You're earning a master's degree. Case is heavily influenced with research. So I think then you have to take a step back and think logically. When you ask the question about what are my inroads to do macro policy work, how would you explain that to an employer? Because there is a chance that you would ask that question of an employer and they might not know what you mean. So I think you have to take a step back and vision, what do you see that being like in a day-to-day -day basis? In my experience, what I've told students is in policy work, generally people that are working on policy have a good deal of experience to draw from, to offer insights, to feed into potential policy. So I think it's really important that as a newly graduated master's level social worker, you also dial it back a little bit and take it to some practical um, areas. So what Gillen spoke about as far as that job he had, it was a very specific area that he was getting experience in. So I think an inroads, Bailey, that for you to consider is think about some of those areas that are very near and dear to you within the social work realm, what type of services, what type of populations you want to serve. And I think that might help you then think about getting your foot in the door into organizations that serve those populations and deliver those specific services. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. We did have a couple of questions that were submitted for from folks that um, were unable to attend um, and things that I think we've touched on some of this as far as like negotiating salary and not underestimate your worth and what would you bring to the agency. Um, did anyone want to elaborate? I think we kind of all touched on it a little bit earlier, but if anybody would like to elaborate on that further, more directly, feel free. <clears throat> For negotiating? Negotiating, and I think the question sort of gets at like, as a fresh graduate, like still knowing your worth, knowing the social work nonprofit realm, how can folks be at least sure that there's like a baseline that they should be advocating for um, and not underestimating? Because I think within social work and nonprofit, it, there is sort of this like, well, I can take what we can get kind of thing, yeah. but yeah. how can we still advocate in that way um, to ensure like, yeah, I, guess, I think some of it is like luck of the draw is like who your boss, like I've been lucky with some bosses who have given me equal pay to an attorney, right? Because they see value. And then some others have not, they say like your social workers, if one was like the boss I was working for and who they believed you to be and how they see your role in the vision of the organization. One, number two, it's so dependent on which city um, what kind of practice, how big the practice is, what kind of organization it is. So it would be unfair to say like, this is what an average social worker should make because it's mm -hmm. just, like, it's just so dependent on multiple factors. Um, and third, I think like pay ranges, does the organization share that, right? Does it show that this is the range because if it's transparent, then you would have a good idea of sharing. And how I approach those salaries is always being confident in my skills, but very humble in my experience. And I think, and that means like, I do share my experience, but I'm humble because you always have to show that you have to learn more because whatever you know, every organization does it differently. And that approach is so important to know that, you know, you're, you're willing to learn and grow and that you have a longevity there, which has allowed organizations to give you a little bit more, like, you know, leeway in negotiation because of the approach. But it's hard, like, you know, it's hard. Yeah, I would just, usually I would look at the, uh, the, the city that I'm working for what was the average pay by, you know, that's, that was how I did it, yeah. Right. I think um, one thing I'm always encouraging students to do is to think out, and it's been mentioned a couple of times, but think beyond just salary when it comes to compensation. There's so much more, and again, it's been mentioned already, but the work-life balance, the support um, that you um, will have with colleagues or a supervisor, um, there's also things to consider like uh, what's the paid time off situation like. There are also um, a lot of clinical settings that will do revenue sharing or bonus structures, which could significantly change, you know, your income beyond what your base pay is. So 
um, I really encourage people to look beyond just that, that bottom line number. There's so much more to unpack there. And thinking about two things like, will your employer pay for your continuing education um, every year if you're um, a licensed person who, who needs to have that? Um, so there are a lot of different, um, a lot of different things to think about when it comes to compensation. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's all really good and things that we touched on. From what I've heard from students also just meeting with them, there's a fear around like underscoring themselves and not sort of at least getting sort of a baseline or being worried about that and things that I've heard as well and maybe Lisa can touch on this too but sort of have a number in your mind or even throw it back at the organization of like well what is the pay range and try to get some more transparency around what they're even going to offer you before they offer it so that's just something yeah. I wanted to add. <laughs> that, and that, I think that's, it's not totally unique to social work, but it really is one of those few areas where you could go through a three interview process and get to the end and you are not thinking the same number that they're thinking at all. And it wasn't outlined ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I think more and more places are starting to post a range, but um, in the past I have, um, you know, when I, when I was thinking about applying for a position, gone directly to HR and just emailed them and said, is there a range for this salary? Um, and that felt a little less, um, a little less awkward than talking directly to, you know, whoever the, the hiring, hiring person is just mm -hmm. to, because um, to, it's a lot of work to apply for jobs and a lot of energy, you know, put out into getting excited about positions and then arranging interviews and, doing a new cover letter every time and all that. And you wanna make sure that you're you're gonna begin with something in mind that's gonna be doable. Yeah, all very great points, Angie. I, I agree with everything you said. I think this, is, this can be a really contentious point and a lot of fear can factor into it. I don't think social work is different from other occupations either. I just encourage that you do your homework. I put in the chat a link to ONET online, um, and it, those, these are federal government sites, and it just showed for the state of Ohio and the national um, range for pay, typically new recruits coming freshly minted with um, their credentials are gonna be in the lower end of that spectrum with the median, um, under the median, the median is usually what market is paying. Um, it's gonna vary by state. You can even pop in a zip code and it'll give you by, um, census statistical area, like we're in Cleveland, Elyria, um, Mentor, I think. So it's a really powerful tool if, if you'd want to check there. Um, from a negotiating standpoint, I agree with other what others have said. Think about your total compensation. Some places you might get a higher rate of pay, but what you're paying towards your health care coverage might be higher as well. Um, in my experience, when I did recruiting, your paid time off is the most negotiable thing. Now that's going to vary by organization as well. But if the, the overall pay rate is lower than what you were hoping for, sometimes you can go back and say, um, well, is it possible to get another day or two um, vacation? And yes, absolutely. If you're going to pay to park, because case, that is not a good thing that we have. If we work at case, we are stuck paying for parking and that comes out of, you know, so when I look back at other places I've worked where I just pulled my car in and parked, I didn't pay anything. Um, it comes, it, you know, that can have an impact. If you're in an urban area, chances are you're going to have to pay for parking. So factor that into your total picture. Um, if you want individual assistance with this, because I've met with, a, like I said, a couple of Mandel students already this year, it, it, this tends to get very personalized, very specific to the role and the organization. So if you want to have an appointment to discuss strategy, we do that in our office. One of the other things I wanted to share too, I used to work at the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging, and I know they used to also reimburse for your mileage. So that's one of the other things that you can kind of look at too. Um, and they used to, you know, kind of sell, um, you know, people that was applying for jobs with that. So um, sometimes you can get paid for the mileage that you travel. And that's a nice reimbursement too, as well. Yes. Yeah, one other caution, I would say, you know, the parking, the hybrid structure, some of these things can be predominant on your mind. 
And as others have already said, you know, it's, it, it's work going into establishing yourself as a candidate. Your power position as a candidate are, are once, is once you reach that point that they're making you an offer. So sometimes, like I give the example of a working parent, I've had situations where job candidates are so preoccupied with a schedule because they're trying to juggle childcare needs that they bring that up in the first interview. You haven't established your value as a candidate that early in the process. So it's better some of these things that you're concerned about, it's better to, to keep your list together and table it until your power position has gone up higher and you've shown your value as a candidate. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate, I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time as I, I even have learned so much. So I really appreciate everyone attending to our alumni. It's been so great, but I'm gonna throw it over to Kim just for some wrap ups really quick and then we can let everyone go. If you have to leave early, that's fine too. <clears throat> Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Sharice, to our two student advancement specialists for all the work with tonight's workshop. And I'm Kim McFarlane. I serve as the Assistant Dean of Student Services and Career Planning at the Mandel School. And we're just delighted that our panelists and attendees could join this evening. And we hope that this was a good way to spend your time as you're thinking about professional development and for our panelists reflecting on your career journey. And we hope that you'll stay connected with the Mandel School as you're moving forward and reach out to our Mandel School support team with questions, as you need to meet one-on-one -on -one about career planning and support, we're here to be a resource as well as those who joined us as panelists. So thank you all for joining. And I think Kelly will drop a few links in the chat for follow-up and be sure to keep in touch. Have a great night and thank you again. Thank Thanks you. everyone.